Thank you for the introduction. It's good to see all of you here. I'm right before the uh, lunch break, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. How many of you here use a database server? Okay, that's pretty much all of you. Okay, that's good. How many use MySQL or MariaDB? Okay, Postgres, MongoDB, something else? Well, I can't hear. Anyway, good to see all of you here. Uh, I currently work at Percona for the, I'm, I've been there for almost two years. And uh, before that, uh, I was on the founding team of MariaDB server, which is uh, fairly popular. It's got over 12 million users now. And um, before that, I was at uh, this company called MySQL. And uh, we, we made MySQL and uh, we sold the company to Sun. And I've also been involved with other open source projects. And if you're wondering where I come from, I come from uh, Malaysia. And today of um, all days, I'm extremely proud to be a Malaysian because we got a new government. These slides will be uh, released under Creative Commons, um, so you can get them. Also, it should be um, quite verbose that if you download them later, you can try pretty much everything fairly easily by copying and pasting in theory. So, let's talk a little bit about attack vectors and what, we're, what the focus of today's talk really is about. Um, I'm going to focus a lot about external uh, attack vectors where you, know, you may have trust-based authentication turned on, uh, people grab your passwords, uh, or your authentication uh, method gets broken into, things like network snooping and or spoofing, uh, theft of a physical server, I've put physical in italics largely because maybe a lot of you use the cloud as well, but you know, you could also get stuff stolen from a cloud server. Uh, and also, how you protect yourself against uh, administrators. So, you know, earlier we've heard examples of admins that leave, um, who get annoyed. Maybe you fire your sysadmin, or if you come from the internet from a long time ago, the famous term is the BOFH. So maybe you've, you've got an admin that's a BOFH. And I can't probably say that out loud, but I'm sure you know how to find out what it means. What we won't focus so much about today is permissions, right? So permissions in the MySQL world is like grants. Uh, that, it's very hard to master grants, but I highly recommend you to master it so you don't grant all on everything to everybody. Uh, obviously can't cover SQL injection. There are plenty of frameworks out there that you could use to figure out why you shouldn't have SQL injections in your code. Your application itself might be vulnerable, so you know, not to pick on WordPress, but you know, it powers nearly 30% of the internet. If you don't update WordPress, you may get broken into sometimes. And uh, it may happen at the most inconvenient times, like you know, right after Christmas, right before New Year's. Uh, so turn on automatic updates, maybe. And of course, um, operating system vulnerabilities. Where, where possible, um, you should always obviously update your OS. Uh, naturally, this talk is also very um, Linux-centric, because um, I don't know anyone who runs a production database on Microsoft Windows. Probably you don't either. So let's, let's give you uh, attack vectors uh, from a much higher level before we go down into the weeds. So trust-based security. Uh, Postgres calls this trust authentication. And you can enable this for local connections as, as well as um, uh, external connections in theory. And this actually happens via socket authentication. And you can find this fairly easily when you, um, when you start up the server. And you can configure this in your PG PGHBA conf. MariaDB server also provides this uh, by default authentication via Unix socket. And uh, MySQL calls this socket peer credential authentication. Now, in MariaDB server, it's turned on by default. Why do you think this is probably not a good thing? Largely, this also means that if your operating system user manages to get broken into, so let's say you've created a database user, uh, and the password for that, the Linux password for that has been leaked somehow, and that person manages to log in. That now that person also manages to access your database. So trust-based security is probably not a good thing to have as a, as a default. 
naturally it's easy to get started. So when you install MariaDB server, it's awesome. Not you don't have to enter a password, but it's not something you want to run in production. When it comes to password snooping, uh, in Postgres, you know it's stored uh, basically is MD5s. But you've also got the ability to have these Scram SHA-256 now, which will actually avoid the risk of duplicate salts being replayed. It's highly recommended that you use Scram SHA-256 if you're not already doing that. And uh, if you're following the development around Postgres 11, you'll realize that they've also got channel, channel binding coming, which will allow your authentication to be very similar to certificate-based authentication going forward. In MySQL today, you want to use the caching SHA-256 password. So I'm very proudly wearing a MySQL 8 t-shirt today. Would have thought that I'd actually put on something with an Oracle logo on it. Um, but MySQL 8 got released maybe two weeks ago as a generally available release. It's, it's got a lot of security features baked in. It's highly recommended you, you try it. And uh, I'm going to talk quite extensively about how it's made security better. And in MariaDB server, there's this thing called edit25519, which is similar but not the same. It's uh, created by Daniel J. Bernstein, and it's not turned on by default, but it's highly recommended you do. And we'll talk about why MySQL native password is not secure anymore, because it basically uses SHA-1, double SHA-1s. When it comes to password attacks, this could be a weak password, like test one, two, three, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm sure you know, many of you have got users that do this. The other one is reusing old passwords. So many, um, many compliance, I don't know what, what it's like in India for compliance, but uh, overseas you, you have things like HIPAA and so forth that you know, force you to have compliance. And I think the biggest deal now maybe is the EU GDPR. And, one way to protect against compliance is they tell you to change your password every 90 days or something. I personally hate that because I have already got a good password via password manager. But it turns out that um, you know, many, to, to follow compliance, you have to reuse all passwords. And um, people tend to, well, you don't want to reuse all passwords. You have to change passwords, and then people tend to reuse all passwords. So you need to track changes of uh, passwords that have been changed. And then, of course, there's brute force password attacks. So you can actually have um, the ability to increase the time before someone logs, it, logs in. So if you get a failed authentication three times, maybe you, you time it out by, say, a minute. And another three times, five minutes. Another three times, you lock the account. And by far, the best in, in terms of uh, preventing password attacks is MySQL 8. It's really got a lot beyond weak passwords as well as reusing old passwords. MariaDB server can definitely help you against weak passwords. Postgres itself doesn't have anything uh, built in so far, but you can use external authentication like LDAP, PAM, SSPI. SSPI is uh, another nice way of saying um, Active Directory uh, and or Kerberos, right? GSS API. And uh, MongoDB also has external authentication via LDAP, but only available either in the MongoDB Enterprise Edition, which you pay some money for, or Percona server for MongoDB, which you get for free. Because Percona makes all the software open source. Network operations. Uh, when you connect to your database server, you want to connect in, you know, in plain text, or you want to make sure you're doing it over SSL. You definitely want to do it over SSL. If you're replicating, you definitely want to do it over SSL. A lot of people tend to say, oh, every, every time I make it a connection with SSL, it's, it gets really expensive. Not true. The, the overheads are definitely not as bad as you think. Um, you never ever want to replicate in plain text in the cloud. Now, replication by default tends to be in plain text, so you definitely want to turn SSL on. You don't only want to prefer or require SSL, right? You want to also make sure that you're verifying the certificate of that, uh, uh, authority to make sure that this is server you're actually talking to. Now, I've got a bunch of references here, and I also talk a little bit about using a proxy called the proxy SQL. So, a bunch of references where you can get uh, some pretty graphs. Now, um, basically in uh, 2017, 
you will actually notice that there is YAZL as well as OpenSSL. So YAZL is a, is a SSL library, now also commonly known as WolfSSL. Previously it was known as something else too. Keeps on renaming itself every few years. There's also OpenSSL, which is a fairly famous library. In fact, most modern MySQLs you get today are fully based on, uh, on against OpenSSL. And you realize that the connection time is, is actually not, not very high. The, the latency with having uh, SSL is not bad, especially once it gets cached. Also, if you end up using something like a proxy, uh, like proxy SQL to manage your large amounts of servers, uh, you can really leverage uh, the time reduction to complete, say, 10,000 connections even. It's a, it's a huge uh, boost. So most large-scale deployments tend to always have a proxy between the application servers and the database servers. When it comes to data theft, um, you can obviously encrypt your entire disk, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, Postgres has column encryption, which is kind of nice. A lot of people ask for this inside of, of MySQL as well. Uh, so you could, you know, if you wanted to store credit card detail, you could, in theory, encrypt that, that column. And uh, both MariaDB server as well as MySQL have at rest table encryption, which means you can encrypt everything and you can use an entire, you can use an external key server for this. Now, data theft is kind of interesting, right? Because it's such that if it's encrypted, if someone got access to your server, but not your keys, and you did a MySQL dump, for example, you, can't, you get encrypted data, which is useless to most people. Now, I can think of many examples of, of how this, is, this has been bad. So, you know, we've had many break-ins, like the Philippine voter data of 55 million people, you know, end up being released. Uh, we've seen every time a Patreon gets broken into, and that involves people's credit card numbers getting stolen, um, there's this website for cheating on your uh, partner that, you know, get, that also got broken into and all the data gets uh, put on the internet. Now, if they only had encryption, it turns out that, well, you, you have a nice big dump of data that you can't do much, much with unless you have the key to decrypt the data. So now we can focus a little bit more on, on MySQL, which is something I've spent uh, in excess of a decade working on. So I'm not going to cover all the old MySQLs. I mean, maybe some of you are still using MySQL 5.0 or 5.1. I'd be surprised if anyone said they were still using 3.23. In, in fact, uh, with MySQL 8 being released, 5.7, uh, 5.6 5, get supported, and 5.5 5 is like really on the really on the end of life. I'm not going to talk about MySQL Enterprise Edition because you got to pay money for that. Uh, there's of course Pocono Server for MySQL, which is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. This MariaDB server, which is a branch, or well, now a fork of MySQL, and uh, we'll cover basically 5.5 right up to the 10.3. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about synchronous replication solutions like Galera, group replication. The X protocol is extremely new, which allows you to query MySQL with a new port, but you can replace, instead of querying MySQL with SQL, you can query it with uh, Python, or you can query it with a JavaScript-like language. So if you are thinking, hey, I'd like no SQL query methods, that's, that's the X protocol. I won't cover NDB cluster because not many people use it. So SQL is a standard, but extremely difficult for you to get the standards document um, for free. Um, but you can find it on various FTP sites. When you use MySQL, or MariaDB or Procurement Server, very interchangeable, I'll, unless I specify it's only for one server. You can do something like select add at global SQL mode, and you'll actually find that as MySQL progresses, it becomes stricter. So all the things you managed to do before, because MySQL wasn't SQL standards compliant, may stop working when you start upgrading MySQL. So it's extremely important to read upgrading guides. MySQL keeps on getting better in terms of security. And you can see how long it has taken to actually get better. So it's, it's actually been a, a over 15 year journey to get better. Uh, and I joined the journey around the time when we were able to get drop user and show privileges. But before, before that, before 323, you, you, you couldn't grant users certain, uh, you couldn't grant users privileges. Um, 
things like show create user, which allows you to see what uh, privileges the user has, is actually useful because if you did grant all, you can now change it. Uh, roles are extremely handy because pretty much every database server out there has SQL standard roles. But they only came to MySQL officially two weeks ago, and in MariaDB, I consider it useful when default role came out, so you could actually assign a default role to users. Otherwise, you'd have to create roles every time. MySQL user table has changed. So if you've written scripts that basically select against the host user password, you'll realize that since 5.7, it, it was removed. However, it is still present in MariaDB. So that's where st things start to diverge. So if you're a very large user of MySQL, where you also play around with MariaDB and MySQL, so your, your scripts now have to become much smarter to do if defs, right? If I detect MySQL, I, I have a different query pattern. If I detect MariaDB, I have a different query pattern. And here's a, so, so that, there's a document that shows you, that compares server 10.2 and 5.7. So password, for example, replaced by authentication string. And you'll note, which is down here. Whereas authentication string also did, uh, did, did exist here. Max updates, these are, these are pretty normal, uh, also new. When was your password last changed? Kind of handy. What's the lifetime of the password? In this case, it's null, but you could set it to, say, 90 days. By when 5.7 first came out, the default the lifetime was six months. Uh, of course, you create a default role. Uh, things like max statement time it will allow you to time out a statement, and if the account is locked or not. And of course, in 8.0, um, this becomes even longer. So it's, it's well worth noting that you could study this and how things progress. When it comes to security features by version, it was McAfee that first came up with an audit plugin, and audit's extremely important. Now, you want to definitely always be able to know what your users are doing, including your administrators. MySQL 5.5, which has been around for an extremely long time now, it came out in 2009, uh, has, has pluggable authentication. And MariaDB 5.2 backported it as well. It allowed you to have the, the ability to have a proxy user. So if you happen to use things like OpenStack, so a lot of people nowadays either deploy their own cloud, say via something like OpenStack, or they use cloud services. And having proxy users is handy because it allows the ability for you to do administrative tasks, but at the same time not have access to the user schema. Things like um, audit and PAM authentication plugins arrived. 5.6 actually gives you things like uh, encrypted client credentials that you can save inside your home directory. The SHA-256 password finally arrived, which is very useful. Things like password expiry. Uh, also, having a random password upon startup, very useful. 5.7 made things a little harder upon installation because you'd have to actually grab for the root password inside the log files. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, do things like expiry of passwords. You can also lock and unlock user accounts. If someone leaves the company, you can just lock the account. You don't have to, to delete the user. 8.0 brought things like roles, further MySQL user table changes. MariaDB, of course, at that point in time, has already diverged as a fork. So you, you still have a different set of roles in 10.0. Uh, you can also have at, at rest tables, uh, table and or table space encryption. Highly recommended the table space. One very unique thing is the AWS key management plugin, which we'll talk about a little later. You can also have user limits. User limits are present already in, Mar in MySQL beforehand. Kona server brings on the utility user, again, tied very closely to the proxy user. Uh, the super read-only option, which allows you to perform automatic failovers with without allowing the super user also to write to the database by accident. So, when it comes to installation, 3, 5.7, no passwords. 5.7 would give you an expired random password, and, in, and eventually the, even the ability for an anonymous user to exist was removed from the MySQL default installation. 
Now, what it, what it means is there's no password. It means when you type MySQL, you could log in automatically. This is, and most people don't like to change their defaults, which is why you'll see uh, occasional news reports saying, and MySQL servers hacked. But you don't see them so often nowadays. You see more like, and MongoDB servers hacked, because the MongoDB defaults are also meant to be easy. But, you know, upon progression, things will get better. So how are passwords stored in, inside of MySQL? Well, here, for one, notice that the plugins, plugin uh, column is not actually displaying anything. However, in 5.6, you'll actually notice that something called MySQL native password is specified. And also now, of course, the auth, auth string is still not now. 5.7 changes this by the fact that you don't even select the password field anymore. So here I did select host user password. Here I'm doing select host user plugin auth string. And um, password is replaced by authentication strings. And it turns out that um, you can actually see, see it here. And in 8.0, you'll notice that the plugin has changed from MySQL native password to caching SHA-2 password. Caching SHA-2 password is now the default in MySQL 8. MySQL 5.7 also provides the ability for you to have a minimum password uh, policy. So you can set it to low, medium, or high. And uh, then if you give a you know, fairly easy password, it'll tell you that you can't use it. It also allows you to check so if, if you wanted to validate if a user's got a good password, you could validate a password like, uh, for example, in this case I use Percona, which gives you 25, and, the be uh, and, and Percona 1 to 3 is 100. So it, it ranges from 0 right up to 100. And again, Percona 1 to 3 works when the validate password policy is set to low. You should probably not set it to low. You could set it to medium. You could set it to high. MySQL native password format, which is deprecated in 5.7 and removed in 8.0, is definitely not some form of encryption because it's just a checksum using the SHA-1 function. So contrary to the MySQL manual, which will tell you that encryption performed by password is one way not reversible, this is not true. MySQL passwords. Uh, do not use a salt, so a generated password on one MySQL server using MySQL native password will match that on another. So this is, this is why you definitely don't want to do things like select password as password. So things get better over time, but this, is, this has been the way it's been for many, many years. So you obviously want to make sure that the root user always has a password. You don't want anonymous users, and I'll tell you why anonymous users are bad probably on the next slide. You never ever want to have the test database. And the best part is MySQL's made it super easy now. So if you run MySQL secure installation when you have 8.0, it will actually make sure that even the validate uh, uh, password plugin is turned on by default. So it, it, by default, things get better. And it hardens it by just running a one-line command. So why anonymous users are bad, if I can log in as an anonymous user and I can access the uh, test table, I can keep on doing inserts and basically fill your disk. So I can just be an annoying, destructive person. Uh, this is just one example of why anonymous users on the test database is bad. So 5.6 starts improving password policy. And it's important to start around 5.6 because many of you may be using MariaDB and, and missing out on what MySQL has been improving in 5.6, 5.7, and then 8. Because many of these things only exist in MySQL now or, or Percona Server. So for one, password expiry works this way. You can also have a password validation plugin, which is turned on. The configuration editor is great if you're going to be doing scripting. And of course, having a random root password on install. Password expiration will allow you to change passwords back to historical value. And this is you know, basically what you'd get in 5.6. But you, know, you can track password changes in 8.0 now. So you can't actually change it back to historical password value. And the bonus is you can, in configuration, say, I'd like to track the last two passwords. I'd like to track the last n passwords. 5.7 definitely improves on password expiry because uh, you, know, you have an automatic mo uh, password lifetime that can be set. 
You can also require one to change a password every n days. You can also have extended SQL around expiration as well as the account locking and unlocking. In terms of MariaDB, MariaDB allows you to chain load password plugins. So you definitely want to turn on the simple password check plugin, which will allow you to enforce a minimum password length, which will basically allow you to ensure that a password is good if it's ABC, one, two, three, four, five, hash, capital B. But that is not a good password, so you probably want to also load the Cracklib password check validation plugin, which will ensure that even if it passes the simple password check, so you got eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, it'll also run it against Cracklib, which is provided on pretty much every Linux system out there because it's via PAM Cracklib. And uh, if Cracklib can crack it, it'll say this is a weak password. Authentication. So Alt Socket will basically authenticate against the Unix socket. This is a nice way to start, but it's also uh, extremely uh, not secure way going forward. Definitely want to use the SHA-256 password. The SHA-256 password is, is kind of expensive because every time you make a connection, it has to, to validate this long password. Whereas the caching SHA-256 password makes it much quicker, which is why it's now turned on by default. Um, add 25519. While not SHA-256 um, follows the elliptical curve digital signature algorithm that OpenSSH uses. There's a Kerberos plugin as well, which will allow you to log in against Active Directory uh, or Kerberos. There is an Active Directory enterprise-only plugin uh, that exists as well. Today, when you install MySQL 8, you'll actually notice that it tells you, by default, it recommends you to use strong password encryption. It tells you not to use the legacy authentication system, especially if you install it in Ubuntu. And uh, this is largely because you want to be secure out of the box. Now, if you, if you say, I am a web hosting company and I have thousands of users with the old passwords, for example, some people will then say, like, like MariaDB, for example, supports the old password format and the native password format. Um, the old password format is extremely insecure. You can, you can break into a password in a, in a couple hundred tries even. Native password, still kind of probably useful, but you, you've probably also read that SHA-1 can't have collisions nowadays. So double SHA-1 can probably also have collisions. Which is again why SHA-256 is the recommended method today. And uh, going forward, we'll see if MariaDB 10.3 also strengthens this to, to make you use ed25519 by default. Secure communications are you know, extremely important. MySQL, of course, gives you the capability to have uh, secure SSL connections. Uh, and you definitely uh, want this uh, turned on. Uh, you, you definitely want to start by connecting you know, via an IPS, and then you can do select statements. So I'm going to give you a few examples so that we can go quicker through this as well. I use a utility called ngrep. I don't know if how many of you use this. But it basically can do net, network traffic grep. And by default, if you, if you notice, yes, you'll notice that select unencrypted is actually showing you the traffic going through in plain text. This is kind of awful because everything goes through in plain text. Now with 5.7, when, when I do select, un, select encrypted, you'll notice that I can't actually decrypt it because basically the client traffic is encrypted already. So 5.7 and greater, encrypted. You decide to, to, for some uh, absurd reason, turn it off, like say SSL equals zero, then again it becomes something you can see. So not very useful. So I highly recommend not turning off SSL and leaving it on. Use SSL, it makes sense. In fact, large, large scale you know, websites today that are powered by MySQL, and that's probably 19 of the 20 websites out there, they all use SSL. Of course, um, it's well worth noting that things get more complex. So with 5.6 and 5.7, these are your SSL server variables. And, and as you can see with 5.7, things get a bit more interesting because they actually tell you where your certificate files are by default. And then uh, with 8.0, it becomes a little longer because of this thing called the X protocol, right? So this allows you to access MySQL using not port 3.3.0.6, but 
just six zero. Secure communications are extremely easy to turn on. You put this in your MySQL D. You basically need to then after that look and see what um, SSL version and SSL cipher you could be using. If you are using an uh, app, any app will make it fairly easy for you. In this case, I, I picked Python, and it'll just this is all you need to do in terms of, in addition to having a user, password, and host. Now, you may think that setting up SSL is a bit complex using the open SSL command. Uh, because you, it's, it involves a manual process, maybe it takes like you know five minutes of your life. And if you're a sysadmin, you want to save that time, you can definitely try this thing called MySQL SSL RSA setup. You should actually do it for you um, with a, in a one, in a basically one liner, and it'll, you'll be set up in less than you know ten seconds even. How many people here use the cloud? Google Cloud, Rackspace Cloud, Amazon Cloud. Okay, so quite a lot of you. Now, if you're using the cloud and you're not using SSL, you're asking for trouble. So, Rackspace, they, of course, have a modifier, a grant modifier, and they actually require you to have SSL turned on when you do things like select, insert, update, delete, and so forth. Amazon has this op option for SSL verify um, server cert. So, it'll verify your database instance endpoint against the endpoint in the SSL cert. Again, useful. Google also has this uh, available, and they allow you to have up to a maximum of 10 certificates per instance. Now, because MariaDB calls itself MySQL, and MySQL calls itself MySQL, you may be using client libraries that don't match each other. Because when you install MySQL, and not MySQL Server, you may be getting a MySQL client library that comes from maybe MariaDB. For one, there were clients uh, pre-573 that would consider SSL just as advice. So it would actually fall back, and you'd, you'd think you'd be using SSL, but you're actually not using encrypted connections. This is, this is not good. So this has, of course, changed. Uh, and then, of course, um, there have been some deprecations, so now SSL mode equals required is preferred. And uh, make sure that your client matches your server. And uh, also make sure that the SSL libraries you're using uh, also kind of match. Now, there was a scenario where MySQL Enterprise did link statically against OpenSSL in the 5.6, I think it was 5.6.18 or 17. And, it had to, and when OpenSSL had that heart bleed bug, you'd actually have to basically recompile the server because it's statically linked against OpenSSL and make a new release. Pretty much everything nowadays that you download today is dynamic and also linked against OpenSSL. So this, so this is an example of using stronger passwords, either the SHA-256 or caching SHA-256 password. You'll notice that you get this nice long authentication string. And this is exactly what you want to aim for going forward. Now, external authentication via something like PAM is kind of interesting because not only does uh, Percona provide a PAM authentication plugin, so does MariaDB. And you can fairly easily configure PAM. Some, of course, support the ability to have PAM groups, and some don't. Now, installing the PAM plugin is fairly straightforward. And um, if you want, what you could do is you could go on a test server, install Google Authenticator, so preferably you've got uh, you know, Debian or Ubuntu, and you can actually even have a, a PAM two-factor authentication with the Google Auth app on your phone, which actually does work. We've talked a little bit about MariaDB Auth plugins as well, and this is a good example of how you'd use edit25519 auth, and again, if you notice, the password is um, a lot more complex and you'd expect from MySQL native password. And add 25519 should also, in theory, not allow you to get you know, broken into easily. Because if, if it was, then SSH would be a, a, a problem as well. Unix socket auth is, as I said, turned on by default inside of MariaDB when you install it on, on Linux nowadays. And uh, you want to obviously turn that off because this trustless authentication me mechanism is not necessarily good for production use cases. Audit plugin. How many of you here use Twitter? Not many. Okay. 
Well, for the ones of you that did use Twitter or follow the news, I think last week Twitter did say something like, hey, reset your passwords, largely because um, we have a system that may have saved your passwords in plain text. But everything else is stored nicely encrypted. And when I read that, I thought, hmm, I wonder if they were using an audit plugin because you know, some early versions of, say, the MariaDB audit plugin actually recorded the passwords in plain text as well, which was actually later realized to be kind of a bug because it's kind of too verbose, so now the passwords are hashed. Of course, we don't know if that's the reason or they had something else, but it's kind of interesting to note that you can audit, an audit plugin can audit everything, including what the root user does. So um, it's highly recommended you turn on an audit plugin because it's extremely useful from a compliance standpoint as well to know if a user touched someone else's data. I think also last week you might have realized that Facebook said they fired someone for accessing a profile of a girl he met on Tinder maybe or something to that effect. Accessing someone's user database is extremely bad. And again, an audit plugin could help you because it'll ensure you know exactly what someone's doing including an admin. There are several formats for the audit log. You know, the, they're basically XML or JSON or CSV. And here are examples of what, um, what, what formats the old and the new format in XML look like. And the JSON CSV format, so you could actually take the audit logs and give it to someone who doesn't know any SQL, and they could also do audits. Now, you'll notice subtly that the MariaDB audit log format is actually different from the MySQL one. And this actually becomes a problem because if you want to grep the audit uh, log, MySQL actually provides a utility called MySQL audit grep. It allows you to grep the audit log by say user or, or command and uh, you can't actually run this free utility. This utility is part of the MySQL utilities package and you can't run it against the MariaDB audit log format. Now MariaDB server itself extended the audit API to allow you to have user level filtering so you can filter by user. Uh, of course, if you have the query cache enabled, you get no table records because it doesn't actually touch a table, it's the query cache. Now the correct size for the query cache is zero because the query cache is not very useful. In fact, MySQL 8 has completely removed the query cache because it's been zero for a long time. For Kona, its audit plugin supports multiple formats, all new JSON CSV. You can also filter by user without extending the audit API. Um, you can also filter by SQL command type, database, and so forth. And Percona, because we're a company focused largely on performance, we wanted to make sure that we also allowed you to have multiple variants in terms of auditing. So you could have um, the ability to have asynchronous audit logs uh, or semi-synchronous or fully synchronous audit logs. And it'll decide when it's time to use you know, memory buffers or drop messages if the buffer is full and when to sync to disk. Yes, auditing can take a hit, but you want to make sure that you're getting the most performant uh, variant available. McAfee being the first one, great. You also have to generate offsets against the server, which they provide a tool for. It's nowadays probably really deprecated by the MariaDB or the Percona audit plugins. And if you happen to use Amazon RDS, you'll realize that they also, as an, in the option group, allow you to use an audit plugin against both MySQL as well as MariaDB RDS. So now, it comes, now we'll talk a little bit about secure storage. You want to encrypt your data at rest. This could include your table, table spaces, your binary logs, and other logs. And key management is extremely important as well. So MariaDB servers overhead is typically less than 1%. You can, um, of course, encrypt also temporary files, which are extremely useful. Encryption is extremely easy to turn on. You basically have to have all those options there. Now, we want to make things easy for you. You don't want to have all those options, because if you miss one, problems occur. So use a preset. Also, a plug-in for the Amazon Key Management Server, because key management solutions tend to be kind of expensive. MySQL 5.7 also includes encryption. You have the ability to encrypt InnoDB table spaces. There is also similar to um, MariaDB, the ability to store the key files on, on your hard disk. Now, this is of course good for testing, but extremely poor for implementation because if I break in and I do a MySQL dump, I also walk away with the encryption key. 
you have to use InnoDB file per table, but that's been the default since 5.5. So if you're not using InnoDB file per table, it's time to change. Um, and then you have to alter the table. So you can't actually just enter data encrypted. You have to first alter it. Uh, it has an external key management solution via Oracle Key Vault, but I'll talk to you a little bit about how you can not spend money on Oracle Key Vault. So various releases came up with uh, you know, various things. So including in, in, included inside MySQL 5.7.19, there's also an AWS key management service plugin. Again, it's only available in the enterprise version. Um, so it, basically, at Percona, we want to make everything nice and open for you. So we also decided to include Vault encryption. So if you use HashiCorp's Vault, and you already have a Vault server set up, you can just use um, the Vault plugin for both MySQL or Percona server, and you can um, store your credentials there as well. And this became uh, generally available also two weeks ago. It's been uh, available for a while, but two weeks ago we had this big MySQL conference, so it makes sense that we announced these things. So, MySQL Enterprise uh, Transparent Data Encryption uh, does have uh, data address encryption for encrypting even the physical files of the database. Now, you can, of course, use other things like LUX and so forth, even basically TDE uses AES uh, algorithms. Uh, Pacona Service Keyring Vault is something you definitely want to try today. Uh, failing which, of course, look at the KMS solution that, uh, that MariaDB has uh, against the Amazon solution. Now, I don't know how many of you here use something like ExtraDB cluster or Galera cluster where you want to have fully synchronous replication. Uh, and um, Percona spent some time making it, making it easy by default. So for one, we write fairly good documentation to ensure you, you follow it. But also, we want to make sure it's such that you could roll it out easily. So we can't change your IP tables rules. But when you do an installation, it'll tell you these are the suggested IP tables rules you have. You probably also encrypt the traffic when, you, when it comes to things like generating keys, enabling encryption. All this can be done um, basically automatically also, programmatically. Database replication as well as something known as the SSD traffic, which is state snapshot transfer, basically referring to the full data transfer that occurs when a new node, a joiner node, joins the cluster and receives data from a donor node. And you want all that to be encrypted as well. And of course, we talked about table space encryption earlier, and you can use something like Vault as well for external key management. So a good quick how-to so that you don't have to worry because you know, our, our general assumption is not everybody is a security expert out of the box. But if you can follow uh, industry standards, then you could become a security expert and you, know, you can have a bunch of things against the checkbox. And uh, that's, that's, that's the aim in, in terms of writing documentation. First, I talked about SQL standard roles, but there's not really much I can talk to you about roles because it's standard in pretty much every database out there, except you know MariaDB and MySQL, which only got it fairly recently. And uh, it's also well documented, so you can group users into roles. So more or less, in conclusion, uh, you want to definitely have things like an audit uh, the ability to have audit. You want to have log redaction because you don't want everything showing up in your audit logs. So you want to be able to configure how you can redact stuff. You want to have external authentication as well. Maybe because you don't want to trust the authentication system or it's easier for the Linux system admin to manage auth centrally. Now, I promised to also talk to you a little bit about MongoDB. And you know, Pagoda server for MongoDB includes things like audit, log reduction, and external auth, amongst other things. Also fully open source and drop-in replacement. You definitely today want to have SSL turned on. The excuse that it's heavy on the CPU is not a good excuse any longer. The CPU time is, is, fa is, is much cheaper than you think. Uh, you want to turn on encryption to prevent, the, prevent someone doing a dump on your database and walking away with everything in plain text and embarrassing you and your users in public. And I think the other really, really important thing is you want to have external key management and either you use Vault or use some other solution that costs money, it's entirely up to you. And most importantly, upgrade your software. Because um, it turns out uh, that uh, it, every time we make new software, we make it better. 
and we make it better because we want to make it more secure by default. We want to give you more features, etc. So upgrading should not be something you are averse to. Read the upgrading guides, run it on test servers, and even though you're running databases, it makes sense to you know upgrade. So I guess with that, I'm more or less open to, to questions as well. And uh, you have a sheet of paper, which I'll call an app today, and you can rate it. So yeah, I'm open to questions. Questions? Um, okay. Yeah. Any questions? Or is it? Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, we see a lot of softwares, uh, you know, being deployed uh, inside containers today. And uh, so the first question is, uh, what is your thought of um, thoughts about, uh, you know, um, deploying databases inside containers? Databases inside containers. So that's the, the first question. That's the first question. I'll, I'll answer it, and then we can have a conversation, sort of. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So databases inside containers. So as long, so tr if you want to do like uh, trust-based authentication. You can do it within the container, but never outside of the container. And uh, if you think of it as a container being secure by default, as long as the container itself doesn't get broken into, all should be well. You should probably also be running things like SC Linux or App Armor. But at the same time, um, you, you know, run your database in a container. It's perfectly OK, as long as the um, similar principles apply. But all that said, um, I guess if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, stateful set is probably the, the only way to have uh, sort of stateful uh, applications at the moment. And it's not like super foolproof. And yes, you can run MySQL with Kubernetes, but not many people do yet, or even Postgres with Kubernetes. Now, um, in terms of best practices of using stateful set, there's not much around security beyond the fact that you should make sure your containers are also you know, well secure. But at the same time, from a Postgres standpoint, the chaps at Zalando actually made a very good presentation about a year ago about how they, they handle containers and deployment of databases. And um, folk at uh, actually Oracle for the DIN DNS service have also made a good presentation around how you could handle uh, MySQL inside of something like Kubernetes. But, at the same, but from a security standpoint, um, there's nothing additional beyond, like, if you're going to use trust-based auth, you make sure it's in your local instance, not exported. Hope that answers your question. You have, an, you have another question, right? So what was the second question? Oh, I kind of answered it already. OK. I think OK, more questions. Question. <laughs> uh, databases. Yep. Another question right there. And uh, Hi, hi, Charles. So we're talking about the audit plugins, right? So what's the overhead uh, on the MySQL server when you like, you know, enable the audit, uh, uh, you know, the plugin base? So the overhead, yeah. So that's a very good question about what the overhead is like around the audit plugin. And uh, yeah, so if you have a very busy server, worst case scenario, so like when I say busy server, we run something like Sysbench, you can actually hit a 10% hit. Now, production use case, it probably is never going to be that way. So if you're running Sysbench, maybe you want to do, um, you want to do uh, asynchronous or turn on performance mode if you're using Pergona's audit plugin. Whereas if you're using the others, which don't have that option, then yeah, it's going to write to disk all the time. So you know, if you know Linux, you know that F-Sync calls are very expensive. So that's, that's, that's the catch. So yeah, it can reduce your performance with something like that by up to 10%. But generally speaking, Real life use cases, this should not be the case. And at the same time, you can switch modes, which should also, in theory, help you. Is that your only question? Yes. OK. Uh, yeah, hi. So uh, actually, one of my questions was the same as uh, uh, he asked. Uh, another question was like, uh, uh, if we can make the MySQL connections over a private network only, is it is still necessary to go with SSL or like? Uh, so the question is, if you have the MySQL only on a private network, should you still be using SSL? And the answer is probably yes. Yes, because you don't know who else will attach traffic to your private network somehow. If you're using the cloud, this can leak quite easily. If it's your own private network, like it's, all, it's in this room, 
a bad actor could still come in, like say like, if I was the bad actor, I could still plug it into your switch and still be you know man in the middle if I wanted to. So turning on a cell probably makes sense. And um, you know all the SSL performance gains that you've seen actually come a lot from the work that's been done and improvements in the in MySQL by companies like Google and Facebook because they publish their SSL improvements. And uh, you know. And actually, that's why Google even wrote the encryption for MariaDB because they, you know, they need it. So yeah, you, you don't want you want you don't want. If, I don't know if you I don't know what the NSA equivalent here is, but um, if there's an intelligence agency and they somehow manage to attach to your network, then then everything's still in plain text. So you want to protect against um, any kind of data exfiltration. So yes, you should probably run SSL, even if it's in this room. More questions? Yep, at the back. Uh, what is log reduction? What is log reduction? Yeah. Okay. So log reduction means, uh, if I give you an example of a log, maybe I want to redact some things like, um, I want to redact, for example, passwords. <laughs> I don't want to store passwords in the log file. I'd like to redact that. That's, that's probably useful as an example. Uh, maybe I want to filter, you know, I want to redact things like um, I don't want to know what a certain user does. That's removing stuff from the log, basically, so that it won't be written to a permanent record. So you want to definitely redact by default passwords. And, you know, most people, by, when they install something, they don't, maybe don't change the default. So if the default was to log passwords, and it's a, it's a poor default, so that needs to change. So that's log redaction. We had another question here. Somebody from this side raised their hand. It's no longer. Uh, so uh, one of the issues uh, as an application developer that you generally um, you know, encounter is uh, how do you configure uh, the connection to a database from an, from an application? Right, so uh, typically uh, the easiest way to um, you know, do that is to hard code your username and password uh, inside the application code or uh, externalize it into a uh, you know plain text configuration file um, of course some some of the languages do support um, uh, you know encryption um, that is supported as maybe a, a native uh, in that program or uh, an external library so so my question is uh, does uh, mysql or mariadb have something out of box um, that the application developers can use. Yes, yeah, so the application doesn't want to store, in this case, the user and password, right? And yes, um, that, that's the question. You don't want to store your um, user credentials inside the application, and, and the answer is actually yes. You can use the, use the mylogin.cnf, dot mylogin.cnf inside the uh, application's uh, user account, and uh, that, that actually works. And that's been available since MySQL 5.6 and greater. Not MariaDB, though, at the moment. So uh, I suggest looking at the documentation around the MySQL config, config editor. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, more questions? So you were showing about PAM and all, right? How you could connect using PAM with your MySQL server. So can you actually have multiple clients uh, using different authentication mechanisms at the same time? Multiple kind of clients? Uh, can you repeat the question about PAM? Yeah, so you were showing about how you could uh, use PAM as an authenticator with MySQL and all. Yep. So can you hatch actually have multiple kinds of authentications for different, uh, different applications? Like I have multiple uh, applications and like can I have different authentication mechanisms at the same right. time? Right. So, so can a user authenticate against PAM and maybe also authenticate against Kerberos is your question, right? Multiple authentications. And yes, of course. Because um, so once you've con configured PAM, uh, it turns out that you actually basically set the PAM per user, right? So I've done create user, external and localhost identified with off PAM. I can have another user created uh, authenticating against Cur GSS API or Kerberos. I can have another user authenticating against any other plugin that happens to exist. So the answer is yes. 
it is uh, on, a, on a user basis. You can have multiple authentication backends if that was a requirement of yours. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, so you, in your talk, you mentioned about uh, GDPR, HIPAA, and uh, Indian Complaints Data Regulations. So uh, I have a question. Uh, it, it may be may not be related to my SQL. Uh, in near future, can we expect uh, the databases, be it my SQL, Oracle, Postgres, SQL, natively support or at least through plugins help the developers achieve the compliance in any way at least masking or some kind of attributes just like constraints database constraints can we specify some attributes for specific fields or columns where i can mask the data yep so a question around masking data. So Postgres, actually, for example, you can mask data via you know column encryption, right? And that's a, a very common request in the MySQL world. So far, we you know we recommend uh, other kinds of, of middleware, so to speak. Uh, will we make it easier for you to maybe remove a user for uh, and, and all traces of the data? Now. That, that's actually kind of hard for us to make a t one kind of tool like that because let's say we, we remove the user on, um, on say, database on, the, on your master server, but you have a time-delayed replica that is maybe delayed by a day in another data center, then, then the data is still stored there, for example, and then we can't control your backups because we don't actually know what your backup policy is. You may be having uh, logical backups. You may be making... Um, a point in time recovery snapshots, and we don't know what your backup policy is. So the question of can we make it much easier for you, uh, it, it very, I think it very much depends on how you have set up your policies as well. But can we make it easier from a data masking standpoint? Uh, yes, of course. So um, I think a, a very good talk, again, might be checking out how proxy SQL can help with data masking. It was presented uh, at at FOSTEM earlier this year. So uh, we, do have, uh, we do have examples where you could actually do something like that with proxy SQL. So again, still using middleware, not quite getting, getting it done in the database itself. Because the database will still be the source of truth. Hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> 